Good evening. Let's turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Revelation chapter seven. Let's take a look at a scripture I have been reflecting upon this week as I realize that this scripture, I believe with all of my heart, is about to be fulfilled. And as we see the signs all around us, it's time for us as God's people to make our calling, to make our election sure before it is too late. Verse number one of Revelation 7. The Bible says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, based on this scripture, the Bible tells us one day very soon, the four winds are going to be released. Amen? But before the four winds are released, what must happen to God's people? They must be sealed. Amen? And we know what the sealing is. What is the sealing that God's people must receive before the winds are let loose? What is the sealing? We know the sealing, all right, I'll take that first, the settling into truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. And, and of course, that's Maranatha, page 200, over on page 201. The settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. This is the sealing of God's people. And just as the sealing of God's people is placed in the forehead, the Bible tells us it is the character of God that must also be placed in our foreheads. And that can be confirmed in chapter 14 of the Revelation and verse number 1. The 144,000, they have the Father's name written where? In their foreheads. And the name represents character. Character leads us to glory, character. So the sealing of God's people, it's God's people manifesting the character of Jesus Christ. If that's clear, say amen. I'll give you a third. The settling into the truth, the sealing of God's people, it brings us back to the keeping of God's commandments. Amen. Character, name, character, name, glory. Amen. And what did the prophet Moses Ask God to show him in the mount. Show me thy glory. Did God expound and even proclaim the Ten Commandments? Did he mention the Second Commandment? He did. So now, which of those Ten Commandments have the seal? The Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So this is talking about the sealing of God's people, manifesting God's character, God's glory, obeying God's Ten Commandments, honoring, adhering, keeping the seventh day Sabbath, not Sunday. Write this scripture down as we look at the seal of God. It is 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 19. God's word says, nevertheless, the foundation of God stand sure, having this seal, there's your word. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. So who are those who shall be sealed? Those who depart from iniquity. Those who depart from sin. And what is sin? The transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 verse 4. So we can deduce that the seal of God's people, they being sealed, is obeying God's Ten Commandments. And notice now, verse number one, when these four winds are let loose, what happens on the earth? Will the earth be destroyed? 
So notice now the loosing or the releasing of these four winds brings us to the close of probation. Is that point clear? All right, one more time. So the releasing of these winds show us the close of probation. Why? Because Jesus says here, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So once the people are sealed, then comes destruction. So the releasing of these winds typify what then? Points to what then? The close of probation. Now put this down. There will be two groups that will be manifested on the earth. How many groups? Two groups. When the winds are released, one group is going to be sealed in their foreheads. There is another group that will receive a mark in their foreheads. Now what is this mark in people's foreheads that will cause them to be lost? What is this mark? It's the mark of the beast. Now what text say that? The mark of the beast in the foreheads. Chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 9 and verse 10. So we have two groups here. One group is sealed. Amen. A second group receives the mark of the beast. So that tells me something then. That means once the mark of the beast is enforced and individuals make their decision, which will be their final decision, then what are released? What are let loosed? Did we mention seven last plagues here? So what are released? The four winds. The winds of destruction. All right. Now, in the winds of destruction, you find the seven last plagues. But hear me now. The winds that are released, the four winds, do not only point to the seven last plagues. Is that clear, my friends? So there will be two groups. One will be sealed. One will receive the mark of the beast. So my question is, when will these winds be let loose? How many winds? Go to Job chapter 1 with me. When will these winds be let loose? And I want to tell you something. My opening words were simple this. I believe with all of my heart that we're living in a time when these winds are about to be released. And I'm going to prove to you this evening that the angels who were told to hold those four winds, they are now gradually releasing the winds. Watch carefully. Where are we going to? Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, we find these four winds again destroying a home. So put on your paper, when the winds are let loose, the four winds, when they are released, destruction upon the unrepentant people occurs. Destruction for unrepentant people occurs. Job what chapter? Look at verse 19. It says, as a matter of fact, verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind, a great what? A great wind from the wilderness and smote how many corners? Four corners. And smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men. And they are what, my friends? And they are dead. So when the winds are released, what happens to those who are unrepentant? Destruction. Look at the screen right here. I'm quoting from Review and Herald, June 7th, 1887, paragraph 13. It says, Four mighty angels are still holding the four winds of the earth. Terrible destruction. Now read this sentence with me very meditatively. What it says. Terrible destruction is forbidden to come in how? To come in full. I wonder if we're seeing today drops or even signs that the winds are being released gradually. Look at this. The accidents by land and by sea. Are we seeing those today? Are we hearing of those things today? Let's read. The loss of life. How? Steadily increasing. Is that going on? Loss of life? Hmm? All right, Jacksonville. All right. Steadily increasing by storm. 
by tempest, by railroad disaster. Is that going on? What's a conflagration? Could that be fires? Fires? Destroying homes and lives? The terrible floods. And what is the next calamity? Talk to me. It says the earthquakes. Are these things happening right now? Come on, here it is. The most recent, August 27th, 2018. Headline reads, two dead, 11 injured in what shooting? Mass shooting at video game tournament in Florida, Jacksonville. And notice, again, just the most recent, and if you look at the bottom section of this chart, you're seeing the tagline, mass shootings in the United States in what year? In 2018. So this, this, this graph, this chart you're seeing right here, are the mass shootings in the various states, cities in America. What's happening, friends? Destruction of life gradually increasing. Move on. Now you heard what was coming, what was coming to Hawaii. And what did come a few weeks ago. Floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. What's happening to the winds, my friends? God is showing us, waking us up. In India, now watch carefully. Watch carefully. We are seeing not the full release of these winds. No. They are released when the Sunday law is enforced. But we are seeing effects or type or typical fulfillment of the releasing of those winds. Look at this. Floods all over, my friends. Venezuela, August 27, 2018. What's today's date, by the way? Hmm? Yesterday, this report came out. Venezuela hit by a 7.3 magnitude earthquake. What's happening around us, my friends? Also in, in, in Australia, rain, all right? What were they experiencing previously? Hmm? Drought, severe drought. Look at this, apocalyptic threat. Dire climate report raises fears. For California's future, it's going on. Wild firefighters, what, what do they see? They see record death toll as climate pushes teams to the limit. That's where we are. And look at this. Just a few days ago, Oregon, earthquake, a magnitude 6.2 offshore earthquake shakes Portland. That's Washington State. Listen what we are told now. The same quotation. Four mighty angels are still holding the four winds of the earth. Skip on down to the red words in the middle. It says now, the winds will be the stirring up of the nations to one deadly combat. <laughs> I'll come back to that. But notice, while the angels hold the four winds forbidding the terrible power of Satan to be exercised in its fury until what event? Until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Red words again. The winds will be the stirring up of what? Nations to one dead the combat. Now, let's pause right there. Look with me. Daniel chapter 7. Where are we going to? All right. That means if we are seeing nations... Literally, um, launching and having rumors of wars against other nations. I want to ask you a question. Are they preparing themselves for when the winds are released? If we see nations bolstering their armies, are they preparing for when the winds are released? Daniel chapter 7, let's prove the releasing of these winds points to wars among nations. Bible now. Daniel 7, look at verse 2. The Bible says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my night, I, I saw, I saw in my vision by night, not night vision, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, what? Talk to me. Let's read. The four winds, there it is, the key words, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Pause. What does sea typify in prophecy? Sea, waters, people. 
So the four winds, okay, affect the peoples. Pause right there. Go back to verse 2. Find the words four winds. The four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Can you give me a present tense word for strove? Strife. So what then would mean the releasing of the winds? Strife. Strife weir. Come on, strife weir. Come on, strife weir. Among the sea. And sea points to peoples. And people live in cities, nations, countries. That's how you know if we are nearing the releasing of the four winds. When we begin to see strife in the nations. Is that going on now? Could we connect with this scripture? Let's come on down. Go to verse four, uh, verse three. And four great what? Talk to me. And four great what, my friends? And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And what does a beast represent in prophecy? Based on verse 17. Based on verse 23. A kingdom. So that means when we find strife and wars in nations and kingdoms, what is about to be fully released? The four winds. The four winds. Now, could we connect with that scripture? Luke 21. And verse number Luke 21 and verse 25. For there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, if you know, let's say it, and upon the earth, distress of nations. Do you see it now? Distress of nations. Strife with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts doing what? Talk to me. Look at the screen. Are we seeing this today? Again, this, these events are not showing us the winds are released, but they are getting ready to be released. The close off. Probation, headline, and all of these are in the month of August. It says, uh, Russia plans largest war games since huh, the Cold War. World War II, the Cold War. Notice, uh, headline, North Korea accuses U.S. of, quote, criminal plot to unleash what? War while talking with a smile. On its face, North Korea warns Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, that what? Denuclearization talks are at stake. If you uh, cut these talks, America, we may have a nuclear confrontation. I want to watch carefully what Sister White says now. Don't forget that last headline. Four mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth to the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The nations of the world are eager for conflict. Are we here? It says, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Pause right there. So when the winds are released, what time do we enter? When the winds are released, what time do we enter? The time of trouble. All right, even the time of Jacob's trouble. And at that time, probation has already been closed. Now, watch the next sentence in red, in the middle. It says now, deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with what cargo? What would you call cargo, a uh, living cargo? People, people. So what could this be? Could this be talking about submarines with nuclear weapons? Did Sister White see that? All the way back in the 1800s? Get to my screen. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great sea. Let's see if we see that going on. Then it says, all who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. Let's read. But they are to be kept under on, on control until the time shall come for the what? For the great battle 
of Armageddon. I wonder if we're seeing these verses now. All of these articles are in the month of August. Headline, it says August 13th, these five submarines could do what? Could destroy entire countries. You know what? Go with me. Revelation chapter 11. Where are we going to, my friends? Chapter 11. Go there. Notice while you're going there, August 9th, Forbes magazine. It says U.S. Navy boosts submarine plans as tensions with Russia and China worsen. Are the winds about to be released? So that means if the winds are about to be released, then what work is almost over for God's people? Again, what work is almost over for God's people if the winds are about to be released? The sealing, am I being sealed? Are you being sealed? Are settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that we cannot be moved. Headline, Fox News, Russian submarine activity, the largest since the Cold War. Then it says, uh, here's why. Here's why North Korea's new missile submarine. And what are the next three words? Ah, oh, beloved. It says, August 19th, the Navy is building a, a new ballistic missile submarine that is truly what? Stealth. Chapter 11 of the Revelation, verse number 18, it shows us when Jesus is about to come and I want him to come. How about you? And he gives us signs. Verse 18, he gives us signs. And the nations were what? Angry and thy wrath is come. Now, I really want to get to the last phrase in verse 18. So once the nations get angry, look at the last phrase. What will God do when he comes? Let's read. And should us, come on. And should us destroy them, which what? Destroy the earth. Back to the screen. It says, headline, this is today, August 28th, 2018. U.S. didn't expect Russia to grow so strong in the Arctic. Why Pentagon is rebuilding Cold War era Fleet, it says, why? Because America, of course, is acting more aggressively, they said. Notice what this says now. Watch carefully. Angels are holding the four winds, which are represented as a what horse? <laughs> as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. What is a question in the blue words? Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? What is God saying to you this evening? <laughs> Wake up. So as you see what's happening in America, in Russia, North Korea, in China, in, 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 in Hawaii, in Australia, in Europe, in America with the wildfires, earthquakes in Oregon, and so on. God is saying, probation is about to close. How dare we find ourselves doing what? Matthew 26. Go there with me. Matthew what chapter? And when probation was about to close on Judas, it closed on Judas, and Judas brought the soldiers to capture Jesus in Gethsemane. What did Christ say to his disciples just before the hour of crisis? The hour of the cross, the hour of his crucifixion. What did Christ tell the disciples to do in Matthew 26 and verse 38 to verse 41? Could you not? He says, tarry you here, watch and pray. But what were they found doing? What were they found doing? And when the hour of crisis came, instead of the disciples being found watching, and praying they were found sleeping and when the hour of trial came did they stand with Christ or did they flee from Christ did they stand with Christ or did they deny Christ and if we are found sleeping what will be our fate as was the fate of Peter James John and the others Proverbs 24 go there with me where are we going to my friends Proverbs chapter 24, we cannot be found sleeping. That's why we have come to this prayer meeting. And that's why Safe to Serve International online, that's why we are here this evening. Proverbs 24, verse 30, 
Bible says, are we there, friends? Are we there? So please wipe the sleep out your eyes. Amen. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. Verse 30. It says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with what? Underscore that. So those who are slothful, and what does slothful mean? Indolence, laziness, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, the Bible says, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. I'll come back to verse 31. Then I saw and considered it well and looked upon it and received instruction. Let's all read in verse number 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of their hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Is it dangerous to be found sleeping? To be found slothful? Go back with me to verse 31. And what covered this vineyard? And what would the, who would the vineyard represent? Us, the church, us individually. So how may we know? Well, before I go there. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened to the ground? And what came up from the ground? Thorns and thistles. Thorns and nettles. So those who are slothful, those who are sleeping, what will be their condition in the end? Holding on to their sins, friends. Unconverted. Thorns. Nettles. Now go to verse 31. I'm going to address thorns later on. Thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. Look at the next phrase in verse 31. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Question, what does a wall represent in prophecy? Wall. A literal wall you put around your house for purpose? To, to protect and to keep things that are harmful on the outside. So what has God given to us to protect us? The law, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18. The law, Isaiah 26, verse 1. It's the law, the wall, salvation. The wall, amen, friends. So those who are slothful, the Bible says you are outside of salvation. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So the question is, we must ask ourselves, in the sight of God, Lord, is my wall still standing? Or has my wall been broken down? Am I being saved, walls, salvation? Am I being saved or am I being lost? The walls, salvation, salvation from sin. And what is sin? The transgression of God's law. So the wall is the law. Y'all missed that. The walls is salvation. Isaiah 60, verse 18, 26, verse 1. The walls, salvation, salvation from sin. What is sin? The transgression of God's law. So the wall is what then? The law. Amen, my friends. So we must examine ourselves. Go back to verse 31. It says now, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns. Pause right there. With thorns. Do you remember Christ gave a parable of the sower? How many grounds were there? Four. What were they? The wayside hearer and the stony ground hearer. And what was the third ground? Thorny ground. Let's see if we are a thorny ground hearer. Hearer, go to Mark chapter 4. It's time for self-examination. Mark chapter 4, look at verse 18. Mark chapter 4, verse 18 says, and, they, and these, and these, and these are they, which are sown among what? If you're there, read with me. And these are they, which are sown among what? Thorns, such as Hear the word. Now look at verse 19. Are you, am I, a thorny ground here? Verse 19. Who are they? They hear God's word. But what happens in verse 19? And the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lusts of other things. Entering in, choke the word. And what happens to them? 
what happens to them? It becometh unfruitful. Put beside verse 19, I'll give you a scripture. Put beside verse 19, Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. The thorny ground hearers are also those who are caught up in the pleasures of this world. So if you're more focused on the cares of this world, the pleasures of this world, money getting, than your own personal salvation, you are thorny ground here. And in God's sight, even though you are working hard every day just to earn money, if you put that above your salvation, in God's eyes, you're slothful. In God's eyes, you're sleeping Song of Solomon. Go there with me. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, go back with me. Proverbs 24. Where are we going to? Proverbs 24. Look at verse 34. Proverbs 24, verse 34 says, again, go back to verse 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of their hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. Pause right there. Which scripture comes to mind? where people were found sleeping where, when they should be awake, and when they were all awakened, they began to travel to get something, and when they got there, it was too late. What now? It's Matthew 25. The ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish, and they all slept, right? But some overslept. Some were sleeping, and didn't have the experience. And when the voice of midnight came, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. The five wise virgins trimmed their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Amen. But the five foolish said, give us off your oil. And the wise said, no, go by. Did they go to buy? So they began to travel. Because they saw their poverty. They saw their need. Hold on. Poverty? Poverty. What is the condition of lukewarm later sins? Poor. I counted it to buy. So many are going to travel when it's too late. To buy what? To buy the oil. To buy what? To get the experience. Oh, may that not be me. What do you say, friends? Go to Song of Solomon. Where are we going to? Proverbs. Go forward, Ecclesiastes. Go forward, Songs of Solomon. Chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Solomon's song, the Song of Solomon, Solomon's song. Chapter 1, verse 6. Are we there, friends? It says, Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were what? angry with me. Why were they angry? Let's read. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Proverbs chapter 10. Go back with me. Where are we going to, my friends? So we are so focused in other people's business, other people's matters, when our own vineyard we have not kept. So we are busy here and busy there and busy with this and busy with that. But the most important thing we are not doing, in God's eyes we are slothful. In God's eyes we are sleeping. Oh, may that not be me. What about you? Proverbs chapter 10. Look with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs chapter 10. And look with me at verse number 5. The Bible says this, He that gathereth, he that what? He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that do what now? Sleepeth in what time? In the time of harvest is a son that caused that shame. Pause right there. And what if, by the way, by the way, by the way, when Christ comes to redeem his people, what is that called? A time of harvest. And which event immediately precede the time of harvest? It's the mark of the beast. Put it down. Harvest is the mark of the beast time period and the second coming. That's harvest. Harvest, mark of the beast, and the second coming. What text say that? Revelation chapter 14. Verse 9 
through verse 16. Harvest, the mark of the beast time period. Harvest, the second coming of Christ. And Proverbs 10 verse 5 says, The one who gathers in summer is a wise son, but the one who sleeps in harvest is a son that causeth shame. I want to ask you a question. Is the sun the law near, my friends? So must we be found sleeping? And we're told in the book, Early Writings, page 38, we're told that Jesus was found pleading before his father. And what was Christ found saying in the red words four times? My blood, father, my blood, my blood, my blood. And then the angel was dispatched and went to the four angels who were told to hold destruction. And what did they say in the blue words in the middle? Four times, hold, 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 hold until the servants of God are what, my friends, are sealed in their foreheads. Next sentence, I ask my accompanying angel the meaning, the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth. That the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were what? Talk to me now. So were the winds about to blow? Were they coming gradually? Watch. But while the hands, their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed upon whom? The remnant that were not sealed and he raised his hands. Can you see him? He raised his hands to the father and he pleaded with him saying what? Father, I have spilled my blood for them. Hold, hold, hold. Hold, hold until I seal my people. Now, does God want us to cry hold just for us to remain here on earth in slothfulness and idleness? Or must we cry hold, dear God, until we can give others an opportunity to receive present truth and be saved? What is it? Would you agree is the latter point? Look at this statement as we bring this to a close. It says, with you and Herald, it says, a moment of respite has been graciously given us of God. What does the word respite mean? Respite. Recession. Recess. Pardon me. Recess. It means an interlude. Respite. A time to work. Amen. Amen, friends. Respite. A break, as it were. A time to take a breath. Watch, a moment of respite has been graciously given us of God. Every power lent us of heaven is to be used in doing the work assigned us by the Lord for those who are what, my friends? Perishing in ignorance. Let's read. The warning message is to be sounded in where? All parts of the world. There must be what? No delay. Last sentence. A great work is to be done, and this work has been what, friends? Entrusted to those who know the truth for when. And I believe this event going on in the Vatican is the moment of respite. The scandal in the Catholic Church. Right here, friends. Right here. Right here. It's a moment of respite. All right. Because we are told when the crimes and scandals flooded the Catholic Church in the days of Wycliffe and the Reformers. It was in God's providence for the Protestant Reformation to go forward. What is God saying to us right now, friends? Headline, August 27th, headline, Washington Post, with call for Pope Francis to resign. Divisions within the Catholic Church, what, friends? Explode into view. Go back and read that statement in Great Controversy, page 86. It's time for us, friends, to bring forward this 
Protestant Reformation. Go to Matthew 14 with me. Are the winds about to be released? I want to say this to you. God wants all of us to understand this crucial point before the winds are released fully. And that experience is we better know that we have been with Jesus. We have to prove him now. So when we find ourselves, when the winds are let loose, we will never be discouraged. We won't murmur, but we will trust him then. In other words, we need to strengthen our Ebenezer's now for that time. Why do I say that? In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus just fed the 5,000 with bread. Did he not? And notice, was the feeding of the 5,000 miraculous? And God was teaching the people as well as the disciples, in time of great need, I can provide. If your life is threatened, I can provide. I can work a miracle to provide, to preserve, to sustain your life. And then Christ now after he fed the 5,000, he said to the disciples, get over into that ship, that boat. Go into the waters and sail to the other side. And while you're doing that, I will go and deal with the people and send them home. And the disciples got into the boat. And they began to go across the seas. And what happened? The winds were released. So what we're seeing in Matthew 14 is an experience we must have for when the winds are released in the last days. If it's clear, say amen. In Matthew 14, we're seeing an experience we must have now for when the winds of strife in our lives become boisterous, become contrary. But if we understand the experience in Matthew 14, we can endure the strifes we, en we, we encounter now and the crises that are ahead of us. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And the Bible says now Jesus went up into the mountain to pray. And while he was there praying, the disciples were in the ship, in the boat, on the seas, and the winds were released upon them. Did they become fearful? Did they begin to murmur? Why were they distrustful when Jesus had just worked a miracle in feeding not only the 5,000 plus women and children, but did the disciples also eat? Did God feed them? Did God preserve them? So why would they at that crisis doubt that God, Jesus, could preserve their lives? You see, their faith was not strong enough to meet the crisis when the winds were released. And so it is, the majority of us, our faith is not where it needs to be. To meet the crises daily and the great crisis ahead of us. And when I saw Jesus in the mount, alone praying, and the disciples in the sea, in that boat, my mind went to his work in the heavenly sanctuary. Christ, where is he? In heaven, interceding. Where are we? On the earth. Where's the wind? Up there or down here? Down here. Amen? So while Christ is in heaven, interceding, we must believe he can give us strength to go through the crises. Go to Matthew 14. Look carefully. It says here, watch, verse 21. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, friends, please listen, beside women and children. So who also need this experience? Women and children. Would you say amen? Would you say amen? Even saved to serve international online. Go to verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went 
up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with what? Waves. Let's read now. For the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Watch carefully. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were what? Troubled. Saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out of fear. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, let's read, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Pause right there. Why would Christ say, be of good cheer to them? What is the opposite of being cheerful? Were they discouraged? Hmm? So when the wind was released upon them, were they discouraged? And this would be the experience of the people of God when those four winds are released. Discouragement. What else did Christ say to them? It is I, be not afraid. Because they were what? Fearful. So what, are, what is happening to many people today as the winds of life beat upon them? Are they fearful? Yeah. Are many discouraged? Are many suicidal, depressed, wanting to give up? But what is Christ saying tonight to all of us? Locally, online, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And notice now, notice, at what, what, no, 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 let's not go there yet. Now notice, first of all, who sent them in the ship? Does Christ know the end from the beginning? Did Christ knew the wind would be boisterous in a few hours? And yet he sent them there. Mercy. You see, friends, hear me now. When we have our personal morning devotion, we have given our lives to God. He sends us on our way. So when we face the crisis daily, we can recall it is Jesus who has sent me on my journey today. So when I meet the fiery trials, the boisterous winds, the contrary winds, I can remember he sent to me, Andrew, be of good cheer. It is I. In other words, it is I also who has allowed the wind to be boisterous. It is not, don't blame Satan, it is I. Because if I did not allow it, Satan couldn't bring it. <laughs> and every test, every trial, Satan has to first come through Jesus. Just as in the book of Job, the, four, the wind that smote the four corners, we began there, of the house where Job's children were in, that wind came from who? Satan, but who had to first give? You, know, you see it now, friends. It is I. Do you see it, my friends? And now notice, notice that God not give them an experience before. What were they eating just a few hours? No, what did Christ feed them with before the wind got contrary? Bread. So what must we eat every morning? <laughs> what must we eat every morning before we step outside our home and the natural wind hits us? You know, breeze, breeze. breeze. What must we eat in our home? We better make sure we're eating bread, my friends. And Matthew 6 tells us we must pray. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us come on now and lead us come on and lead us not into temptation but you're preaching now amen now notice 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 at what watch did jesus come to them go to verse 25 and in what watch in the fourth watch no friends if you know anything about the biblical watch there are four watches in the night. Four watches. How many? Four watches. And each watch covers three hours. Now, Christ sent them at evening in the first watch to go over the waters. 
Now, when the wind got contrary, got boisterous, did Christ come in the first watch? Mercy. Did Christ come in the second watch? Did Christ come in the third watch? In what watch did Christ show up? In the very last watch, he showed up. I wonder why. What was he building in them? Hmm? Faith. The trying of your faith worketh what, my friends? Patience. Patience. Let patience have her what work? Talk to me. Have her perfect work wanting nothing. So notice now, if I'm praying, and if you are praying, when the winds hit us daily, and Christ doesn't show up, the first time we pray, the second time we pray, the third time we pray, must we give up? Why? Because we know he's going to show up. Amen. He will show up, my friends. Put down gospel workers, uh, 258. Ask, then ask, and you shall receive. Pray for humility, courage, increase of faith to every sincere prayer, to every sincere prayer, and answer will come. It may not come just as you desire or in a time when you look for it but it will come in a way that will suit your need in every prayer we pray in loneliness weariness and in trial God answers how not always according to your expectation but always for your good will you show up my friends Oh, beloved, look at this now. Watch carefully, watch carefully. Matthew 14. And in verse number 28 now, it says this. No, where am I? Look at verse number. Verse number 26. And when? No. Verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out unto them. And what was Christ seen doing? Now, that's very interesting there. You see Christ walking on sea, on the water. Pause right there. What was the water doing to the disciples? Driving fear in their hearts. So what was making the disciples fearful? Jesus was walking upon that thing. <laughs> so what threatens your life? Christ is showing by illustration, I have already conquered what you fear. He's seen walking upon the waters. That's it, my friends. Power. And notice, when Peter saw Jesus trampling on the foot, what had threatened his life, Peter said, I want that experience. I want that experience. This is no bedtime story about Christ and Peter walking on water. The experience is the water was threatening their life. Pause. What has caused you to be fearful yesterday, today, last week, last month, this year? Christ is saying to you, I have already conquered that thing. And Christ is saying to you, do you want this experience that I have to conquer your fear factors? That's it. Peter says, I want that experience to walk upon, to trample on the foot, that which has uh, brought fear in my heart. And what did Peter say? Lord, if it's you, bid me come. If it's you, bid me come. And Jesus said what? Now watch. He said, come. One word. My friend, one, Christ's word has power, my friends. He said, come. And Peter, hearing the word, believed the word, and by faith, he could walk on water. But again, this is not some bedtime story. Faith will give you power to trample on the foot. The very thing that has brought fear in your heart. Come. And he believed the word. What is God saying to you tonight? Mercy. I didn't hear you. That was weak. Come. What is God saying to you tonight, Safe to Serve International? Come. Will you come? Now who should come unto me? All ye, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come and watch this now. Peter was come down out of the ship, verse 29. He walked 
on the water to go to Jesus. Watch carefully now. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Pause right there. Did Peter get victory for a moment? Now, I don't know how long that moment was. But did he receive power and victory for a moment? Was he walking? Was he trampling on the foot? That which has threatened his life before brought fear into his heart. And just as the Lord allowed the wind to pick up. Do you see it, friends? He took his eyes off Jesus and began to what now? Sink. In other words, Peter represents people today who already know the formula of victory. You missed that. Peter represents to the people who already know the formula of victory. But as soon as the winds of life get more boisterous, they forget the formula and begin to doubt. And as a result, they begin to sink. Not sink in literal water per se, but emotionally, they begin to sink. Mentally, they begin to sink. Emotionally, spiritually, they become weak. They become so heavy, they can't even walk. They don't feel like eating, nor living, or eat too much. They begin to sink. Why do I say that? Because Peter had begun to walk on water. That means he had the experience. Do you see it, friends? He knew the formula, but as soon as the winds picked up, he forgot the formula. Are you a Peter tonight, my friends? Because I believe the majority of us know the formula. Come, faith, come. Walk by faith. And what God is teaching, once you begin to walk, don't expect the wind to become less boisterous. No, 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 no. The wind will pick up. The wind will pick up. It doesn't get, friends, what's ahead of us? The four winds are going to be what? Released. So question, naturally, are the winds going to get worse? Prophetically, are the winds going to blow harder? So as you're walking by faith, don't expect the trials to become lesser. To become infrequent. That's the word. No, they'll become what? More frequent. That's it, friends. But notice now, the experience you got previously is to, is to strengthen you for the next trial. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. The man walked on the water. And then as he began to sink, what three words the man uttered? Lord, save me. I began to think about that. Lord, save he acknowledged who God was. Save, he was saying, Lord, I need salvation. Save who? So what, what was he saying? I see my need, friends. Lord, I acknowledge you. Save, here is my need. Here's my need. Save me, I see my personal need. I see it, Lord. Do you see your need tonight? What must we all, what must we all say then? <laughs> What must we all say to my friends? Lord, save me. Save me. Will you do it? Yes. Did he say, Peter? Yes. You know, friends, I'm going to close right here. Then Christ said in verse 31, when Christ caught him, O thou of what? O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou Doubt. And of course, later on, the wind ceased, and they all said, Thou art the Son of God. Amen. O oh, thou of what faith? Christ does not want little faith Christians. No, he wants great faith Christian. For my devotion, praise God. This morning in my devotion, I'm reading Matthew 8. And Christ said of the, the Roman centurion, I've never seen such great faith. Matthew 8, not even in Israel. Peter, oh thou of little faith. Friends, little faith Christians 
are not going to be prepared to meet the coming crises and when those wings are released, friends. What faith do we need? That is the third angel. They keep the commandments of God and what? The faith of Jesus. Is Christ faith little? You can't have little faith to meet the time of, the great time of trouble. To meet the great time of trouble, what faith do we need? Great faith, my friend. But hear me, Christ will begin and accept your little faith now. But remaining with your little faith, you are slothful. If you remain with your little faith, you're slothful. Indolent. You're sleeping. Do you see how all the dots connect, my friends? Connects full circle, friends. Little faith, Christians. Great faith. How do we get the faith? Faith cometh by and hearing by the word of God. And what did God just feed them with? Bread. Bread. The word, friends. Oh, and did they, not, did they not fill their bellies? They filled their bellies with literal food, but their spiritual appetite was not satisfied. Their spiritual appetite was not satisfied. In closing, do you know what I thought about? If I saw Peter walking on water, and I'm in that boat, I'm going to say, Master, I want to walk on water too. And I'm wondering why the other disciples didn't say, Lord, bid me come. Here's my point. If you see one walking on water, say, dear God, I want that same experience. That's my point. Elisha, I want that double portion on Elijah to fall upon me. If you see one. Now, what does it mean to walk on water again? Huh? What now? You are conquering your fears. To walk on water, you're conquering your fears. Whatever threatens your marriage, your life, your finances, your health, walk on water. Come. Will you come, my friends? The Savior's calling. And if you see somebody giving testimonies, I'm conquering my fears, say, Lord, I want that experience. Bid me come. And what will he say? Come, come friends. Come. Will you come today? Kneel with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words tonight. We come. Give us what we need. And prepare us for the winds of strife daily. And when the four winds are released, and help us now in this moment of respite to, to go and prepare others. We thank you that we can walk upon water. We can conquer our fears. Romans 16, you said in verse 20, I will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. We can walk and tread upon serpents, scorpions, adder upon the devil's head as we heard this Sabbath I will put enmity between thee and the woman I will crush his head Lord we want to walk upon water conquering our fears conquering sin save us we pray in the name of Jesus Christ Amen